Is that better? Much better. There's no light on the subject. Thanks. Thanks. Right. How's that? That's better, right? Thank you, sir, for coming. Okay, if uh, if you will, will you uh, stand for our uh, invocation? I'll turn it over to Don Bear. Are we ready to pray? Yes. All right. Almighty God, we come to you now asking that you give us your blessings as we open this meeting of the Sons of the American Revolution. We come with a heavy heart this evening as we remember one of our own, Louis Suarez. Louis was a dedicated member who as Vice President of Wards served in his capacity with dignity and dedication. He will be sorely missed. We can be comforted in that we know he now rests with you. We pray for his family, asking that you give them comfort and peace during this time of grieving. We read in your word that weeping may remain for a night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. We can't get away from hard times, but we are consistently reminded in your word that it will pass. We will endure, get stronger, and joy comes in the morning. Almighty God, you have made all peoples of the earth in your image and for your glory to serve you in freedom and peace. Grant to the people of our nation a zeal for justice and the strength for forbearance, that we may use our liberties in accordance with your gracious will. Heavenly Father, you gave us this good land for our heritage, and we humbly beseech you that we may always prove ourselves a people mindful of your favor and glad to do your will. Bless our land with honorable work, sound learning, and pure manners. Save us from violence, discord, and confusion, from pride and arrogance, and from every evil way. Defend our liberties and fashion into one united people, the multitudes brought here from many lands, kindreds, and tongues. Endue with the spirit of wisdom those to whom in your name we entrust the authority of government, that there may be justice and peace at home, and that through obedience to your law, we may show forth your praise among the nations of the earth. In times of prosperity, fill our hearts with thankfulness that in the day of trouble, suffer not our trust in you to fail. And now, Heavenly Father, I ask that you give each officer of this chapter wisdom and knowledge to conduct the business of the McKinney chapter. In addition, I ask that you bless each member of the chapter who are here in attendance with good health. And for those who are with us by Zoom, I ask that they might be in good health as well and will be in attendance at our next meeting. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. All right. So, uh, let's see. Nathan, could you lead us in the uh, pledge to the flag of the United States? Right, please. Let the pledge to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God. <laughs> Indivisible, liberty and justice for all. Mark, would you lead us in the place of Texas? Texas, one state under God, one indivisible. Boss, Yes. We, the descendants of the heroes of the American Revolution, who by their struggles established the United States of America. Reaffirm our faith and then Thank you. You may be seated. So, when y'all have been coming here for a while, do you notice any difference here about where we're where we are right now? No boxes. No! Yes, there are. There is not a single box of potato chips or to go bottle. They ran out of napkins? Oh, okay. I think so. I think it's a favorite test. Well, we're excited to have our space back here again. It looks a little more professional now. It's very good. 
Okay, so we'll start with the self introductions. I'm going to, I think I'll start over here first with Claude. And okay. if you would, for the people on Zoom, we'll pass the mic around. Sure, uh, Los Rivi, Secretary. And on Zoom, we have uh, Bob Milwee, Tom Whitelock, and Don Babb. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Colin Nelson. I'm a son of our speaker, Andy, and also the I guess, great, 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 great nephew, nephew of <laughs> Tom. Yeah, so happy to be here tonight. And, and yeah, I was going to say, and for our friend back there with the uh, impact, uh, he's, he's, got, he's, got, he's got his <laughs> ring. Do you have that ring on? Oh, okay. He's got that ring on. Good. All right, I'm Andy Nilsson. I'm uh, Tom's nephew, Colin's dad, to keep all the relations straight. Uh, and your speakers. Hi, I'm Carl Flowers. Um, welcome to the Carpenter's first guest. Hawaii, Liz Barry McKinney. Good evening, I'm Pete McClellan. I'm from McKinney and I'm the Sergeant at Arms. Joe Chenoweth of Vivian Allen. Mark McCraw of the Dirt Peter Ford with the Kate Chapter. John Greer, Mike Tamarkin in Texas, and the Captain Shabani. Hey, yeah. Ted Wilson, Ed and Cheryl, also a member of the Kate Chapter. Ed and Barrow, and remember here. Matt Hoover and my father Ned. We're here in McKinney. George Cracker, McKinney Chapter, and my wife Joy in the DAR. Yeah. Jerry Kenny, McKinney Chapter. Bill Terry, McKinney Chapter, and my wife Carol. Hey, we did everybody? Think we did. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> Do we know who we have on the Zoom? Yeah. Uh, uh, Bob Milley, Tom Whitelock, and Donald Babs. Yep. Yeah, got three on Zoom for that. Okay. Um, let's see here. I was going to tell you here at the beginning, but I'll think about it during the program. Oh, well, I would. Uh, Carl Flowers is with us. Carl has given several programs to us, and uh, he's a very interested uh, person in uh, the Revolutionary War period. And in fact, he's going to be our speaker at the next in person uh, Board of Managers meeting here in October. Okay. And so uh, we're, we're working on that. We're happy to have you. And, and, and we're trying to figure out any way to get him in here. <laughs> and, but the problem is, he keeps telling me that everybody came over on the boat and went to Ellis Island. And I just can't believe that that's the case. Out of all those people, it's got to be one of them. Maybe I can be related to Alaska. Alaska or something. Maybe we can get some other. So, so I, I have uh, uh, decided that I'm going to make a position for him. And he's going to be he's going to be our uh, basically a uh, uh, friend of the chapter, okay? I think that's totally acceptable, don't you, Nathan? Mm -hmm. And and like I said, because of his interest in Revolutionary War activities and the things he does with it, as uh, some of you may remember, well, he thought he might could pick up a tidbit or two from this, and so I said, well, just come on and have a barbecue. So, thank you for coming, Carl. Appreciate you. Okay, so next up, we're going to go ahead and do our program first, and then we'll go for the business, and I'm going to turn it over to you. There you go. So our program tonight is a reborn in the Ozarks, Henry Rowe Schoolcraft, 1818 through 1819. And Andy Milson is our presenter tonight and is related to Tom. And Tom twists his arm to get here. But uh, but Andy, Andy is a professor of geography at UTA in Arlington. Um, he has a PhD from the University of Georgia and a BA and MED degrees from the University of North Texas. 
His most recent book, Arkansas Travelers, Geographies of Exploration and Perception, 1804 through 1834, and it talks about the travels and the perceptions of William Dunbar, Thomas Nuttall, Henry Rose School, Schoolcraft, the gentleman he's speaking on tonight, and George William Featherstone Haw, as they explored Arkansas frontier in the early 19th century. The book was awarded the 2020 GG, excuse me, JG Ragsdale Prize by the Arkansas Historical Association. Uh, Dr. Nelson enjoys teaching courses in human geography, historical geography, regional geography for undergraduate students at UTA. He's been honored numerous times for his dedication to teaching by the UTA College of Liberal Arts and the National Council of Geographic Education. In 2020, he was inducted into the Academy of Distinguished Teachers at UTA. And more importantly, his son was Texas a &M. That's right. <laughs> Have we said that? Have we said that enough? So please, please uh, join me in welcoming Andy Wilson tonight. Thank you. Yes, nothing makes me prouder than my son here. So, uh, thank you. Um, so, the uh, gentleman I'll talk with you about and are about tonight is uh, Henry Rose Schoolcraft. Uh, and there is a, uh, a Sons of the American Revolution connection here. So, uh, Henry uh, was the son of Lawrence Schoolcraft, who uh, served in the American Revolution. So, he was, Henry, I guess we could say, is one of the original Sons of the American Revolution. Uh, he was born in New York after uh, the Revolution uh, in 1793. Um, his father, after the war, became the superintendent of a glass factory. Um, and once his son became of age, uh, tried to get Henry involved in the glass making business as well. Um, but by 1817 or so, Henry had proven himself to be pretty inept at uh, serving as a superintendent for a couple of these glass factories and uh, ultimately went bankrupt. Um, 1817, you might know also, is not a particularly great time for a young man to be trying to make it. Uh, there was a financial panic around this time. Uh, and so the economy was in, in shambles and so forth. So he did what a lot of young men do uh, who were you know, in their 20s around this time. He decided to leave New York and head out west. And at that point in time, of course, west meant Missouri. So his uh, attorney, apparently, Mark appreciate this, uh, <laughs> in his bankruptcy hearing, I guess let Henry know, you know, I'm heading out to St. Louis. Henry decided to tag along. Okay, I'll, I'll go too and see what I can make myself out there. So he, he began touring the mining operations, the lead mines and so forth, in southeast Missouri, uh, and heard of large, uh, uh, heard reports of large deposits that were off uh, in southwest Missouri, the area that's now Springfield. Um, of course, mining had been going on since the time of, of the French uh, sort of occupation of the Mississippi River Valley. Uh, and so he decided he would sort of see, could he get involved in that kind of industry? Uh, one of the young men that he encountered here in, uh, in Southeast Missouri that will be of interest to us as Texans was Stephen F. Austin. Uh, Stephen F. Austin was the same age as Henry Rose Schoolcraft. They were both 25 year old men at the time that, that Schoolcraft came here. Uh, and of course, Stephen's father, Moses Austin, was in the lead mining business. That's what brought him to Missouri from uh, Virginia and ultimately led him to, you know, consider taking up the Mexican government on setting up a colony in Texas. Of course, Moses died on his way back. Stephen F. Austin became a famous Austin. So uh, they lived in a place called Potosi, uh, Missouri. And in 1818, Early November, Schoolcraft sets off from Potosi uh, through the Ozarks to head off towards Southwest Missouri. He couldn't find any other uh, experienced backwoodsmen to go with him. And we can sort of have to read between the lines to perhaps understand why. 
Uh, they were saying, you want me to go out there near where the oat stages are uh, at, at this time of year. Um, another problem probably was uh, there's some other clues. This might have been bear hunting season. And so a lot of them were saying, sorry, I'm busy. I'm heading out. You know, I, can't, I can't roam around the Ozarks with you. So the only person that would go with him was the son of his attorney, a guy named Levi Pettibone. So the two of them took off in, in late 1818. Um, and to skip ahead, I'll, the tour is what I'll tell you about next, but just kind of give you a sense for Schoolcraft's life beyond uh, this period. Uh, when he returned, he published a report on the lead mines. Um, and it was as he was heading back um, to St. Louis that he encountered another um, expedition, the James Long expedition, which is famous for heading off into Missouri territory um, to, I believe, the Yellowstone area. But he found out that, you know, the federal government has money to support these expeditions. They had done the Lewis and Clark expedition. There was a lot of federal interest in exploring these lands off to the west. Uh, and particularly trying to find mineral resources that might be uh, valuable uh, for mining operations. So he, a light bulb went off and he said, you know what, I can probably start petitioning the federal government to support the kinds of things I want to do, which is continue to go out in places like this and go exploring. He somehow managed to get a meeting with John C. Calhoun, who was the Secretary of War at the time, and I think maybe also President Madison, uh, Calhoun seemed impressed with him and appointed him to be the mineral mineralogist on the Cass expedition, which uh, was led by a man named Louis Cass, upper Mississippi River, area around Minnesota, Michigan, uh, northern Wisconsin, and so forth. Same kind of operation. Uh, when he came back, he managed to land his, himself a position as the U.S. Indian agent um, in uh, Sault Ste. Marie there on the, on the, in the upper peninsula of Michigan. And he stayed there for about 20 years. He married a Chippewa woman. He learned the Chippewa language, became very interested in folklore. And so most people know Schoolcraft more for his work with the American Indians, uh, for his work as a U.S. Indian agent. Um, unfortunately, in 1842, he, uh, well, I guess it would have been 1840, he backed the wrong presidential candidate. <laughs> so his days of, of living off of the federal uh, government, uh, you know, ended suddenly when he, you know, had, had uh, not decided which way the wind was blowing. He was backing the wrong candidate. So he lost his position. Uh, and, and several other horrible things happened. His wife died and so forth. Uh, he managed to, uh, in the late 1840s, again, get a position with the federal government doing an Indian statistics program. Uh, most scholars kind of view it as being a hodgepodge and a mis mishmash and, and really not very well done. Uh, so unfortunately, that's sort of part of his legacy. Um, by the 1860s, you know, he's, he's getting into his uh, 70s, um, which is point in time, uh, fairly old for, for a gentleman to make it, uh, suffered a series of strokes and passed away uh, during the Civil War in 1864. So let me tell you about this journey he makes as a young man to um, through the Ozarks. So this map right here, uh, and I, I put a red arrow on here to kind of show you some somewhat of what's going on. But this pathway is the pathway of a man who is lost. Uh, you, know, you can look at this and see. If your goal is to get to point B over here and you're starting with point A, going down here and back up there doesn't make a lot of sense. So what happened was they thought they had crossed uh, into a certain, uh, into the Gascony River system. They hadn't made it quite that far west yet. So they started heading south. By the time they got down here into Arkansas, they were lost, they were about to starve to death, and so forth. Uh, they, they did, well, I won't get ahead of myself too much, but I'll, I'll tell you a bit about their journey here. Uh, but this is the overall path uh, of that journey. So we're looking at the southern part of Missouri, the northern part of, of Arkansas. So as he began his journey, he's going kind of on a, a plateau uh, that's there in uh, Missouri. 
and uh, he <laughs> has some some critical things to say about the, the landscape. One of the things I'm doing in my book is trying to think about the environmental and the cultural perceptions that these different uh, travelers uh, write about. Uh, how they portrayed this space at that particular time. So of this space in, in Missouri, uh, that's uh, here kind of along the Big Piney River. He said, when the Edinburgh Reviewer estimated that Louisiana, he's talking about the Louisiana Purchase, only cost three cents per acre on the average of the whole number of square miles in the territory, he probably had no idea there was any part of this which could be considered dear at that price. Uh, yet I think it would be uh, money dearly expended in the purchase of such lands as we have today traversed. Not, not particularly impressed. Uh, he did um, encounter some bears in this area. And this is, I think, kind of a humorous anecdote of just really how much of a greenhorn uh, he really was. Uh, so after setting another new course, uh, they spotted four bears that were in uh, trees along their pathway. Uh, reflecting on the trip so far, Henry remarked, we've not sought to go out of our way for the purpose of hunting, uh, but this was too fine an opportunity to exercise our skill in hunter sport uh, to be neglected. The men decided to give the bears battle. <laughs> so after trying to uh, tying their horse to a sapling, loading their guns, they approached their prey. The bears, of course, quickly spotted Henry and Levi, began to climb down from the trees. Henry and Levi decided to charge toward the bears in a clumsy attempt to keep them in place. Uh, but while running across this rugged ground, Levi tripped and sprained his ankle and fell. Uh, as the last of the bears hopped to the ground, Henry fired his gun from 50 yards away and missed. Uh, the bears loped away over a ridge into a field of tall grass, and Henry and Levi spent about an hour trying to sight the bears again, but couldn't find them. Uh, all this did was make the sprained ankle worse, um, and Henry confessed that the bears certainly were victorious. Um, this causes them some big problems, though, because they don't have any medication or anything that will handle something like an injury. They brought some Lee's pills, which were uh, at the time something people would take for indigestion, and they brought some salve that was intended for, you know, scratches and cuts and scrapes and that sort of thing. Nothing that would really help uh, a sprained ankle. As they began to head a little bit further down the uh, North Fork River, Henry begins to uh, come across some territory that he's impressed with. So he said that one of the springs uh, that they ran across deserves to be ranked among the, the natural phenomena of this region. Uh, the spring rushes out of an aperture in the limestone at least 50 yards across, where it joins the main river about a thousand yards below is equal to it, both in width and depth, the waters possessing a purity of crystal. If you've ever gone hiking in the Ozarks in some place, um, there are these, these great sort of limestone formations, waterfalls, and so forth. Um, a little bit later, he, he notes that there were wild turkey and duck, uh, gray squirrels almost constantly in sight. Um, they've uh, seen lots and lots of deer. Uh, and so they, again, come across a couple of bears and say, hey, let's, let's try again. <laughs> He said, so they each put an additional ball in their guns, and Henry reported that they examined our priming. Uh, then taking deliberate aim, both fired at the same moment, but neither shot to the effect. So <laughs> they're pretty, pretty useless as hunters. I think about the only thing they managed to do is perhaps injure a bear, uh, which didn't help when you get too close to it. About three weeks after they departed Potosi, so they're, they've been lost here for a while without completely realizing how lost they are. Uh, they reached and entered Arkansas. Their situation was really dire at this point in time. They'd been without bread for more than a week. There was only enough cornmeal to last for another day. Their supply of dried meat was gone. Um, even if they had the skill to hunt for fresh game, they'd run out of shot. Uh, this was not the original plan. Uh, they had expected actually to make it to the White River in about half the time they've been uh, traveling so far. 
So this sort of rings of a, of a Gilligan's Island sort of trip, you know, it's like a three week tour that was only, you know, not, not supposed to be nearly this long. Um, so running in slow on supplies, unsure of whether they had reached the White River, they hoped to find a hunter's cabin. Uh, but so far, they had only stumbled on a few abandoned camps. Their luck began to change um, as they uh, got in, into Arkansas. And this is an area today known as Bennett's Bayou. They ran across a family uh, called the Wells family. Um, and, and so far, I can, I can say that Tom and Colin and I are not related to the Wells family. As far as we know, uh, but Henry was not impressed with these people. Uh, he described their house as a place that would disappoint any person who's had an opportunity of witnessing the abode of man and civilization. Um, he said, nothing could be more remote from the ideas we've attached to domestic comfort, neatness, or conveniency without allusion to cleanliness, order, and the concomitant train of household attributes. Which make up the sum of human sum of human felicity and refined society. He's very high-minded in his uh, in his critiques. So he meets the Wells family. They're uh, a large party. I think probably they're in a hunting cabin, about to go hunting. I don't think that was where they lived. So I looked for them, and I think they actually lived up in, in Missouri. Um, but they agreed to help these two guys who were lost go back and find their horse and maybe point them in the correct direction. And even said uh, they had, had discovered that these two young men had some money with them. Said, okay, so for a price, we'll take you back to your horse, to your camp. We know about where you're talking about. Uh, we'll, we'll hunt a, a turkey, maybe a deer for you, so you'll have some meat. And then we're going to go about our way. So they took off, they got back to the camp. The guy's sons tried to go find some game for them, came back with, with not much. Um, and then the next morning said, well, see you guys later. And they hopped on their horses and, and took off to the astonishment of, of Henry and Levi. So Henry had some, some pretty harsh things to say here about the uh, hunter character, uh, described their adverse, uh, sorry, avarice, uh, their flagrant violations of engagements uh, that they had promised um, and basically saying there's, there's nothing left to punch your character to admire. These are some of the quotes, by the way, that are used frequently by historians to describe the Mozart <laughs> people at the time. And, and, and it makes sense in some ways if you think about it that these negative kind of, you know, salty epithets and so forth of the things that grab our attention. So as we're reading this, we go, wow, he really let those guys have it. Um, and so those are the kind of things that get quoted. So one of the things I wanted to do was also say, you know, we also ran into some really good people in the Ozarks and describe them uh, as well. So they make their way, they finally find their way to the White River and begin ascending up. And he meets another family that he has completely opposite kinds of things to say about. This is the McGarra family. Can't find a relationship here among us, but these are the people I hope my family would have, and our, our family in Arkansas uh, was like. Uh, he described the McGarra uh, family as having a field with several acres under cultivation where they raised corn, several horses, cows, hogs. The house was of logs built after the manner of the new settler in the interior of Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois. Uh, he, and he provided um, uh, Henry, they had a hand mill for grinding corn, a smokehouse filled with bear and other meats. Uh, the interior of the house, you know, had some, had some evidence that the occupant had once resided in civilized society. <laughs> that was his way of, of giving them a compliment. Uh, and actually, believe it or not, books on the shelf, these people could read. Um, so he said, you know, this is a family that appears to live in great ease and independence, surrounded by numerous uh, sons and daughters, uh, received us cordially, gave us plenty to eat, bid us welcome to stay as long as we were pleased to stay. Uh, at, when they left the McGarra farm, um, Mr. McGarra handed uh, Henry a knife and said, go in the smokehouse, cut, you know, whatever you need, take it with you. 
So, you know, very different kinds of kinds of people that he ran into. Throughout the White River Valley, he describes the, the beaver, otter, raccoon, deer, uh, bear, and so forth. Uh, and the, the hunter's practice of catching all of these animals, making skins, um, collecting during the fall and summer, uh, taking down the river in canoes uh, down the White River. So it, it's not on the map here, but the White River eventually flows into uh, the Mississippi near uh, uh, Helena, Arkansas, I believe it is. Uh, and so um, that. I take that back. It flows down into the Arkansas River, which then flows into the Mississippi. All that to say, this was this White River was sort of Main Street uh, for this part of the Arkansas Ozarks. Um, so he he saw that you know they were sending skins down the river on the way back. They would they would in return bring wild honey, bear's bacon, buffalo beef. Uh, Salt, pots, axes, blankets, knives, rifles, all kinds of things were being traded um, along, this, along this river. So commerce had already come to this space very quickly after it had become part of the United States. Finally gets near his uh, <clears throat> destination here, and uh, Mr. McGarrett pointed in the right direction. Got uh, near what's present-day Branson, uh, Missouri. All the shows weren't there at the time, of course. Uh, so, uh, but he stays with another family, uh, the Holt and Fisher families. And um, they actually spent about two weeks there uh, over and even including Christmas. So they, he describes quite a bit about how this backwoods family lived, uh, what their daily life was like and so forth. Uh, but he was not particularly impressed uh, with uh, these two families. He said, to him, all days are equally unhallowed. And the first and the last day of the week, find him a light sunk in unconcerned sloth and stupid ignorance. Uh, he neither thinks for himself nor reads the thoughts of others. And if he acknowledges his dependence upon the Supreme Being, it must be in that silent awe produced by the furious tempest when the earth trembles with concussive thunders and lightning shatters the oaks around his cottages. That cottage, which certainly has never echoed the voice of human prayer. So he was not impressed. We think today of this being a fairly religious space. At that point in time, the hunters living there didn't have much to do with religion. When he did talk to people about religion, they said, yeah, those preachers come along through here every now and then, but you know, they're just telling lies or whatever. They weren't, they, they didn't really participate much in, in in religious life. Um, and he just, so there's an interesting description, I think, here of the boys and the girls. We get a sense for the Ozark children living in this house. Uh, he said, by the time they reached the age of 14, boys had completely learned the use of the rifle, the arts of trapping beaver and otter, killing a uh, bear, deer, buffalo, dressing skins, making moccasins and leather clothes. Uh, I didn't know any of those things when I was 14, and I, I still don't today. <laughs> uh, but you know, if, you're, if you're here, this is your education. Uh, they're then accomplished in uh, customary things, uh, capable of supporting themselves and the family, and accordingly enter into marriage very early in life. Rurals, on the other hand, now the, the, yes, sir. This was all, this expedition was all funded by the federal government? No, not this one. This one was uh, most likely funded by Moses Austin. Well, that's the same, right yeah. in the middle of the War of 1812. This is, uh, so that war ended in, in 1850. Yeah, so just after that is when the economic downturn occurred. But uh, there was a lot of movement into Arkansas uh, after the War of 1812. Um, yeah, so there wasn't federal government money. Um, mm -hmm. I, I was never able to find exactly where he got the funds. Um, but my guess, and what seems most likely because he was staying with the Austin family, is that Moses, Moses Austin said, sure, if you want to go out there and see if you can find some deposits, <coughs> you know, that I might be able to expand it to, you know, go ahead. Um, the girls, on the other hand, are not the kind of girls that the boys here would probably want to marry. So <laughs> he describes them as having ruddy complexions, uh, being rather gross. 
they live chiefly on animal food. Uh, they're deprived of all the advantages of dress possessed by our fair country women in the East. Uh, they are by no means calculated to inspire admiration, but on the contrary, disgust. Their whole wardrobe until the age of 12 consists of one greasy buckskin frock, which is renewed whenever worn out. So the boys got the backwoods education, and the girls, unfortunately, uh, it's not, not a pretty scene. So he eventually then gets up to his um, destination near present-day Springfield on the James River. If you've been through that area, you know it's also uh, lots of nice topographic change and so forth. Beautiful, beautiful space through there. Describes there being a, an assemblage of beautiful groves, prairies, uh, river alluvian, highland precipice, uh, the course of the river, the promontory. Uh, you know, really striking the beholder with admiration. Um, on their way back, uh, he went with uh, Mr. Holt and Mr. Fisher, uh, guided them up here so they wouldn't get lost again. Uh, and one of the gentlemen's horses was, was with them. Uh, and unfortunately, they began to get a bit lost on the way back. It was snowing, uh, they were sort of losing their, their trail. Uh, and so uh, either Mr. Holt or Mr. Fisher said, hey, I'll watch this. I'm going to let the reins loose on my horse, and he'll guide us home. So Henry and Levi were saying, "Great, you know, we're really, <laughs> we're really in for it now." Uh, <laughs> but this horse, the animal took its own course, sometimes climbing up hills, <clears throat> then descending into valleys, crossing over streams, and at last, to the infinite satisfaction of all, and to the surprise of myself and co-travelers led us to a, the top of a commanding precipice which overlooked the valley of the White River. And they could see the smoke coming up from their, from their cabins. So the horse actually did no way up. Uh, so joy sparkled in every eye. <laughs> they decided instead of trying to go back overland to get uh, back to Potosi, that they would take the White River. Uh, they were told by several people, you know, this is a much more well-traveled course, they'll run into a lot more people, uh, and it's, it's a beautiful canoe trip. So they, uh, they took a canoe down the White River, um, and uh, this, a lot of this area now is, is you know, part of a, a reservoir, it's been dammed, and so much of what he describes, the beauty here, uh, is now underwater. We can't see it 200 years later. Um, but he describes this, uh, this scenery that's bold and enchanting um, that uh, you know, anyone from a landscape painter to a geologist to uh, a botanist to the agriculturalist to the man of business would find this to be you know, just a wonderful place uh, to visit and to, and to see. So they get down to um, <clears throat> what is now Norfolk, Arkansas. <laughs> Uh, which is where the Buffalo River flows into uh, the White River. So this is an area today that's still fairly rural, uh, canoeing and so forth. Uh, but Norfolk is a, a nice uh, sort of transition point in there. Uh, and they stayed at a tavern here uh, and, and, and got sort of uh, involved in a, a, an Ozark party. Of, of 200 years ago, not one that they really, I think, intended to be a part of. Uh, here's how he describes it. Whiskey began to circulate freely, and by the time they had unloaded their canoes, we began uh, plainly to discover that a scene of riot and drinking was to follow. Um, of all this, we were destined to be unwilling witnesses. For there, as there was but one house, and that a very small one, necessity compelled us to spend the night together but sleep was not obtained. Every mouth, hand, and foot were in motion. Some sank, uh, some, sorry, some drank, some sang, some danced. A considerable portion attempted to do all three together. And a scene of undistinguishable bawling and riot ensued. An occasional quarrel gave variety to the scene, and now and then one drunker than the rest fell sprawling upon the floor and, and a while remained quiet. 
Uh, he says, we, we remain listeners to this grand expedition of human noises, beastly intoxication, and mental and physical nastiness. And I'm hoping my son hasn't been in the fraternity part. <laughs> <laughs> that resembles, <laughs> resemble this dis, dis, description. And he says no. <laughs> <laughs> no says no. All right. Uh, they reached uh, what is today Batesville, Arkansas. At that point in time, I think that better name, Hope Bayou. Um, and this is where the uh, Southwest Trail, it's also called the Military Road, came down from St. Louis to uh, ultimately to Texas. So cut sort of diagonally across Arkansas. Uh, through southwest uh, Arkansas to where roughly today, where uh, a little north of where Texarkana is. Uh, and this is where Tom and I have found our ancestors, was there in that southwestern portion of Arkansas. So, this was the point at which he could begin to take an overland path back to Potosi. Um, and uh, fortunately, uh, makes it back. Uh, and, and says when he arrives that, you know, several people uh, essentially said, gee, I thought you were dead. I, you know, <laughs> I, wasn't, I wasn't expecting to ever see you again. You've been gone for two months. Um, so he did make it back. Uh, and it's, it's a really interesting story. I've just given you a little taste of it today. Um, as, as Mark mentioned in the introduction, uh, the book I wrote here a couple of years ago, uh, it's called Arkansas Travelers, uh, and there's four uh, different expeditions that I talk about uh, in the book and sort of look at their environmental and, uh, and cultural uh, perceptions of Arkansas during that period of time. So, thank you very much. Any, any questions? Did they actually find any oil? They didn't, no. Um, they, they found some, uh, what looked like old uh, smelting kind of things. So it was enough to maybe make some shot. Uh, they didn't uncover any significant kinds of, uh, kinds of deposits there. So as far as their writings, would they distribute those or were they, they just kept them? Uh, or how, how did, I guess, how did you come across all this? So he, he had a, he kept a journal and then edited it after the fact. Um, and published it as a um, as a journal. There was a real uh, interest in travel literature at that point in time, and so that's part of where I found was able to get the the writings of these these four different uh, travelers. Yeah, there was a market for it to sell. So, yes, sir. <clears throat> did the name of Gara mean anything to you as far as Holland County is concerned? It did not. I'm hoping they'll that, like I will tell you, I think McGarry was the first county judge, but okay. there is McGarry Cemetery here. And so, why you were talking to when you got up to McGarry, I said, well, you know, that's kind of an unusual name. Yeah. Listen to this. Uh, this man George, is James McGarry. George McGarry was one of the earliest residents in the, the area of Collin County. The twin brother John, they started out and they they founded the town of Buckner. Now, Buckner is where the, the uh, old uh, trade, day. trade day was, and that okay. was destined to be the county seat, but they lost out in, uh, in an election. So the descendants of uh, George Garris said that one seventh acre of land to use for the cemetery. They're talking about the cemetery. But listen to this. George, uh, George McGarrow was a member of the Peters Colony, brought his family to this area, and 1840s. Prior to his arrival in Texas, McGarrett had lived in Fayetteville, Arkansas. Okay. Right. It's the family, yeah. Yeah, where he had credited with helping build many of the historic structures still existing in that city. His wife died in Arkansas in 1838 and so forth and so on. So they were among the founders of this county. That's great. And probably that same McGarrett family that put it. Painful is right up there. It is, yeah. They they were very close to Washington County. Oh, so. that. Uh, uh, in, in, uh, but anyway, that. So uh, this man might have been George's father or something like that. Could have been. George might have been there at that point in time. Like one, of the, like one of the sons that he's talking about. Must, there great. must be a connection between all of what you've been talking about and the founding of Collin County through the McGarrett family. Ooh, very cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the publisher will let me all add that. <laughs> <laughs> well, they do the next version. It's, it's, a, it's an unusual name. Uh, 
he actually spelled it with Gary or something like that right. in the in his journal. And then I, I searched the ancestry and so forth and found the, the family that was there at the time. I'm, uh, I'm on the Cone County Historical Commission, and uh, there is a the George McGarry Cemetery historical marker in Joe McDoss. It's uh, done quite a bit of research, and they've got a historical marker here with and so on. So they might look at that. So, well, I found and that was out of Texas, so maybe there was a little bit of that. That's just an object with Google. Yeah. Old Maguera Road and in the cemetery is in my neighborhood. Oh, okay. Yeah. Great. Thank <laughs> you. Now, if Henry had gone farther west, if they where Hot Springs is, you would have seen that. Did one of your explorers uh, come to Hot Springs? So, uh, uh, Dunbar. Uh, came up from Natchez, Mississippi, went up the Washita River to Hot Springs. Um, Dunbar was supposed to go from the, the, the expedition they planned was supposed to be sort of a southwestern counterpart to Lewis and Clark. Yeah. They were going to look for the source of the Arkansas River and then transit overland to the Red River. And they had no idea how far apart these things were and that they were way further west than they had any idea. But um, that was one of the things Jefferson taught. He was William Dunbar was in correspondence with Thomas Jefferson to do a second expedition along with Lewis and Clark. Dunbar could have been the other Lewis and Clark um, if they had, but they, they, they probably would not have survived. That film. If it's, you go know, west of Hot Springs, is it there a diamond deposit someplace? Yes, there? yeah. And the Hen Henry missed all this. The good stuff. Henry missed all this. <laughs> 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 that's right. Yeah. And, uh, no uh, one. The uh, Fenshaw. So his his name is spelled Feathersonhaw, but but like the English like to do, it's 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 Fenshaw. So we drop a whole bunch of letters. And, uh, he actually traveled down that that military road and and went to examine some of the magnetite and that sort of thing. Doesn't mention the diamonds, so that that wasn't discovered until later. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Did you press the Yes. Oh, so, Dr. Russell, thank you so much for speaking with us tonight. Uh, we have a certificate from you or for you from the, the Kenny SDR chapter a certificate of appreciation. And it's dated uh, May 19th and it's signed by Tom E. Nelson. All right, I know that. <laughs> <laughs> Is everybody signed the attendance sheet? All signed. Good. Uh, yeah, oh, 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 okay. Yeah, great. Thanks. Thanks so much. So, a couple of things he didn't mention, which if we get jammed up for another meeting, I may get him to talk about this. <laughs> But in our in our search for our, our Milson ancestors, uh, we actually went over there where we found where they were, what's the, what I call the uh, brick wall was, you know, uh, 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 basically over in Arkansas, Washington, Arkansas, went over and found the land where they lived on and the town they came into. And when, when Thomas Milson died, uh, he basically. Uh, the doctor had been treating him, sued the, the widow, one of our great great grandmothers, for, for money, but she'd already been to the court of probate equivalent. And so basically, the judge there said, No, we're already done with that. You're not going to sue that lady for any more money. So anyway, the guy said, We're going to write a book someday about this, this greedy doctor that did something, you know, there. But just sort of interesting. The other, the other tidbit, and then we'll get off of this, is, is that so it turns out back. Around 18, 18 or so, the Emil Hussle and got yeah. James Gwynn Milton, yeah. James Gwynn Milton, Emil Hussle and okay. He had a daughter, Rebecca, and she married our Thomas M I L S O N. Now we're talking about Arkansas here, okay? <laughs> You're getting this right, okay? So we worked real hard on this. And believe it or not, they were not cousins or anything, but that's a whole different story for another time when we need another speaker. Anyway, thank you so much, Andy and Colin, for being here. <laughs>
Oh, and Andy's about what two two months in, I guess, to the application process. So probably in another month or so, month or month and a half, we'll, he'll be a member of this chapter. So so then we can call him any night. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Okay, so let's get on with the business at hand tonight. Um, I see all all the announcements. Uh, last last month we did not approve the uh, April minutes because uh, uh, basically we just didn't quite get them ready in time. So at this point in time, uh, uh, those minutes are posted out on our website, and I would like to see if there might if there's a, a motion for us to uh, accept those minutes as written. Okay, Pete, we'll do that. Okay, do I have a second? I'll second. Okay. And uh, do we have any discussion? Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Motion passed. Okay. Great. Thanks. Okay. Uh, the next meeting is on May 16th, right oh, here. We believe June. That would be the other May, the next May. What did I say? <laughs> oh, no. So that, that that's bad news. Okay. So scratch that out. June. Uh, June. I'm glad you caught that. So, so June is the 16th, right? It is right. I got half of it right. Okay. That's where I'm at with the technology right now. About half of it. That's right. Over now. Okay. So anyway, so we're going to be here again, and hopefully there won't, the boxes won't start building up again because I like this a lot nicer. This is quite nice. Um, relative to the new business, uh, John, could you come up and talk to talk to us about the project that we talked about for the veterans? Um, Basically, John is our uh, basically handling our veterans affairs, and uh, basically he wanted to talk about a project that him and I have talked about. We'd like to do and get the chapter participation in. And so, without further ado, John, if you got this latest issue of the SAR magazine, you will notice there is an article in there from the National Chairman of the Veterans Committee about the VADS representatives. They are saying it's a new program where well, I have been the VADS representative for the North Texas area at bottom since 2012. So I've been going to the bottom VA for quite a few years. Uh, the uh, VA has been closed to volunteers uh, the last two years. We just had our first meeting about three weeks ago. Uh, things are beginning to change a little bit. They have, it is no longer called a volunteer. Uh, somebody came up with this new idea that they're going to, what they're going to do. It's, it's, I can't even remember what it is, the CDC or something of this nature. But um, we always did a pre 4th of July cookout for the VA. And we, uh, in the past years, we've been furnishing watermelons. Uh, but right now, it looks like they're not going to do this. But one of the things that a project that we can do is uh, they give us a list of the needs that they would like to have. And one of the things I would like for this chapter to do, you go into a family dollar store or, or any of those dollar stores, you see these? Okay, five, five, five or ten of them. Big, big printers. Big print. Specific, that's five big print. If you board 20 by 20, I bought 30 the other day. I found a place up in Sherman, I'm like, it's from the 89 cents piece. And I, I, I picked up 30 of them. They have 115 people in what they call the community living center. And those are the uh, people that, to be honest with you, a lot of them are just. The families took them up and dumped them because they didn't want to take care of them. And they don't have anything to do except play dominoes or do crossword puzzles or these. So if you can come up with these and bring them to one of the meetings, and Tom and I will collect them and uh, we'll get them to the VA. So they, they don't have to do it right now, but it's an ongoing thing that you can pick up these. So crossword puzzles also, but the word of Find the word is real easy for them to do, especially for John, I know we're talking about the VA on 
<clears throat> but there's also the state home up there too. Yes, and we still support them. And Absolutely. In fact, we are allowed in there. We did uh, March 29th, which is now known as Vietnam Veterans Night. Uh, I go up there. We went up there and did a program just to entertain. And then we presented 32 of the commemorative lapel pins. I have the National Society of the, of the <coughs> Commemoration that handles that for me. I used to have to do it. But they, they send the pins up there, but we go in there. Was, there was eight of us that went in there March 29th. And what we did was we actually pinned these pins on these veterans. And that's one of the most enjoyable things that, that you ever do is see it. Uh, you know, Nathan's name, but it's a, it's a nice, very nice deal. Um, one of the most enjoyable things that I've ever done is, uh, you know, the people that are on the wall, the KIA, when they died, their mothers got to go to store people. Well, what they are doing now is they are giving the siblings the gold star pin. And I presented two in the last month. And that's one of the most enjoyable things that I've ever done. What that means is if you know somebody that's on the wall, you know the family, usually probably these, these siblings were 13, 14, 15 years old. They were never given anything when their brothers died. Now, I can get a gold star pin that we can present to that sibling, that brother or sister. Now, it usually takes two months to get the last one I got in three weeks. Uh, it comes from the Pentagon. When I get an email from the Pentagon, you think it's scary? <laughs> what it was, your package is on the way. It will be there at a certain day. It is signed by the Secretary of Defense. It is a really nice item that they done. So if you have anybody that, that uh, you know that's on the wall and you have a family, uh, get in contact with me, get in contact with Tom, tell them you get in touch with me. And we can get them a really nice, and we can present it. Now, uh, I have to do it. I have to, because I am a community partner. I have a form that I have to fill out. And what I do, which makes it so much easier for them is, is I get a uh, copy of the, the information on the person that's on the wall, where he served, when he was killed, and what his last uh, office was. You know, there was like corporal, or sergeant, or whatever. Then, then I do what I do is I find out <coughs> if, it's a, if it's a brother, then I can get the the uh, uh, birth certificate of the brother that says that he's a brother because the government's going to do this, but I do it for them and it makes it a whole lot easier. Then if it's a, a sister and she's married, what I did was I got the birth, I got the marriage license. So it showed that her maiden name. So basically this is the kind of information that the Pentagon will, will do, and it takes them a little while longer to do it. But since we're all genealogists and we all know how to do all this, it makes it makes that the whole idea to do. Uh, do you any of you have any guinea caps that you got that are, have never been used? I do. <laughs> okay. uh, they won't they, they want guinea caps up at the VA. These guys like to wear caps. So if you got any type of a cap that's brand new. That you're not using for those uh, cookies that are kind of these little ants, cookies that you can buy and pour in the milk. They want those kind of things. There's a lot of things. Uh, we've got a list. I'll, I'll, I'll send that list out. I've got a list of their needs. And so we can bring these to the meeting every time. Now, right now, uh, the only way that we can get them up there is uh, uh, my next meeting that I'm going to be there will be July the. I believe it's July the 11th. So we have enough time so we can get them together. And we can, I can take them and we'll okay. take them. Take them but take you, them. Have to, you have to contact them. Take them to the same lady. Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. But, uh, if you have any questions, just get over to them. Sure. When, when do we want these books by? Or is there a deadline? Or just. Well, I, I was hoping maybe, you know, if you want to do it, try to do it by the next 
meeting, but okay. I mean, we'll, 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 you know, I'm going to sort of bring in a basket or something. If you bring stuff, just throw it in the basket, you know, or, or whatever. Okay. And I'll send out the list of all the things they need. So we get credit for everything we take to the VA. They put a dollar amount on everything that we take. When we volunteer at the VA, uh, when I'm up there volunteering, and I'm a, because I'm a registered volunteer, uh, and Tom comes, he said, yes, volunteer. They credit us with about $23 an hour. So at the end of the year, they total up everything that we've done. And they, uh, the SAR in the North Texas area has been uh, responsible for about $35,000, $40,000 worth of uh, the items that we've done for them. So it's bus travel time. Bus travel. Bus plus travel. People say bus travel time. Oh, let's try it. Yeah, let's try it. What I do is when I go to the VA, uh, it takes me an hour to get there. And I'm usually there two hours and I'm, I'm back to town. I've got right now over 300 hours. So I've made close to 100 trips to Bali in the 20 years I've been going up there. Um, and when we start doing, they start allowing us to do things again, we open up our campus when we do the new things. Yep, okay. Thanks so much, John. Mm -hmm. Hey, I would say, uh, um, you know, uh, like late, last Christmas when we had our Christmas party, we did a, about approximately 200 Christmas cards, okay? And we signed them, basically, and I took all those up there and I got word back that, you know, it was very well received because some of these guys, they don't get anything. I mean, they're just there. And so we start thinking about what that would might mean to the or even where they get some of these things like you, know, you sit around all day, you know, and, and some of these crossword puzzle books or whatever or something a little different. And I will tell you, if you don't want to go to the dollar store or something, you can go on Amazon and put in there, you know, um, large print crosswords or word binders, and they'll pop up with all sorts of them. If you're a prime member, you know, you just give me a credit card and they'll deliver right to you over, right? So yeah. it makes it really easy. So, so try, try to get, you know, this touches your heart, you know, we'll pick some of them up and bring them up and John and I'll get them up there. Anyway, thank you so much, John. Appreciate your presentation. Okay, let's see. Next up, um, flip this down. Okay, let's see here. Okay, now we got the regular minutes. Yeah, okay, the, the regular minutes have been published for the last meeting. It was published on the uh, website. Do I hear a motion to accept those minutes as written? No, that was May. This is, I mean, that was April. This is current. Uh, yeah, current month. Yeah. Okay, so I'll move, second it. Okay. Okay. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Okay. Okay. So uh, if you if you were at our last meeting, uh, as as you recall, you know we lost our treasurer. Uh, Basically, uh, the complications from COVID is what happened to him. And uh, so I put out a call uh, basically for nominations for the, the Office of Treasurer. Uh, uh, after that meeting, uh, our, what, what, is this your third month of meetings? Or second this month? is my third one. Third, third meeting. Okay, uh, Peter came up and said, I think I can do that. And I, I said, yeah, well, it's not too bad. And he said, well, Hopefully it's not too complicated. And so I said, okay. And then I had, uh, like I said, I'd asked for, for other uh, nominations to come in and I received no other nominations. Keep me straight here on this page. That's up here somewhere. Okay, so, uh, so at this point in time, I, I would like to open up the floor to see if at this point in time, are there any other nominations? Anybody else here would like to take on that position? Hearing none, okay. So hearing none, uh, I'd like to make a motion. Uh, let's see here. To I said I put that to accept uh, to, to uh, basically uh, elect is that all right or approve uh, compatriot uh, Peter Ford is our new treasurer. Do I have a fair motion to do that? I make the motion. Okay, we got a couple of motions. Uh, I hear a second. Second. 
David Kinsey's online. He's second. Oh, thanks, David. Okay. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. All those opposed? Okay, fine. Okay. Peter, come up here. You got it. Uh, uh, Swear you in. Okay. You go raise your right hand. Uh, the Patriot uh, Ford, having been duly elected to the office of treasurer in the McKinney chapter, Sons of the American Revolution, do you promise and swear to support and defend the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution and bylaws of the National Society, Sons of the American Revolution? And do you further promise and swear that you will faithfully discharge the duties of the office to the best of your knowledge and ability, and that you will at all times conduct yourself in a manner worthy of our society? So I hope you got it. I do. Okay, one more. Okay, congratulations. Okay, now a little more here before he gets to that. Okay, okay. So, uh, compatriots of the McKinney chapter. I have officially installed this officer, uh, duly elected by you. May I now remind you of your obligations to him, assist, support, and encourage him in the discharge of his duties, thus furthering the principles and purposes of the Sons of the American Revolution. We will. We will. Okay, great. Right. Do you have a report this week? Good week. So, so I sort of stepped out of the bank a little bit. And so he's already he's already been working on this for a while. So he's going to give you the monthly report here. The current, the current balance is $6,407.18. There's no outstanding checks or deposits. Uh, I've reconciled the account going back two years. Everything balances to the debt. Okay, correct. I assume that 16000 includes the money from the flow down the states, right? Yeah. These are uh, yeah. deposits. Oh, they came in. They came in. Three deposits. These are the checks cleared. And this was. Uh, okay, let me show Let me show right. I want to make sure David didn't short changes. David, you still on there? I am. All right. That looks pretty good. It might be off a few few cents, so we'll we'll talk about it. Yeah, it's fine. Okay. Oh, that's because that's because you didn't charge enough on his application, so I had to dock you. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Where are you, David, anyway? Uh scrubbing windows trying to pack this house. Oh, you're at home. Okay. All right. Well, we'll let you we'll let you get a pass on this one. Okay. <laughs> Again, Peter, can we give him a round of applause? I mean he He just joined and he said, that's something I can do to help and I want to help. Okay, so thank you so much. I know you're going to be a great member. I knew he's going to be a great member because before you were even a member, I put out the call for the wreaths across America wreaths and he bought wreaths. And when we were up there on that cold day up there at the, uh, at the cemetery in Anna, him and his wife were out there putting the wreaths on the graves. Okay, so I knew we this was going to be and on top of that. It is next door, so I have to say that. <laughs> okay. okay, let's see here. What do we got next? Uh, do we have any other business from the floor? Yes, sir. Yeah, I just wanted to report that the Matthew Bolton CAR chapter invited me to their May meeting next Sunday, the 21st. Okay, okay, would you? coordinate with Mark and let's pick a time when we would like them to come, you know, toward the end of the year, like we always do. We can still have a speaker or if they want to do more of a presentation like we've had them do in the past. But just if y'all could coordinate on something out there, I think it shouldn't be too hard right now anyway. We do have Carl on for September, right? Yes, And the clock's still ticking, right? <laughs> So uh, anyway, but you all record it that way. You can ask them, you know, let the planning, and then that's when we'll give them their uh, their check also. Okay. Uh, any other business from the floor? You had some color guard news. Bob uh, Noe. Color. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Hold on, hold on, Smith. Do our microphone trick there. Our Bluetooth. <laughs> Go ahead, Bob. When are you ready? 
All right. There's a color guard rally this Saturday at the Frontier Village in Denison, Texas. Muster time is 10 a.m., which is at 111 R.C. Vaughn, if anybody is interested. Also, there is a Memorial Day parade in downtown Denison. Uh, Main Street at Armstrong is going to be the muster place, and we'll be lining up at 8.30 a.m. on that Monday, the 30th. Anybody who's interested, please attend. Okay. Sorry, Bob, I, I meant to call on you about that. And then the next, what's the one in this? Okay, yeah, that's right. Okay, we got it. Okay, hey, thanks a lot, Bob. You doing okay? Yeah, yeah, I'm doing fine. There was a discussion last time about a flag retirement, I guess, with the DAR and SAR on that on the same Saturday coming up. I, I didn't know. I don't, I don't think, I don't know anything about it. There's one in Plano, I believe. The okay. Right okay, I'm getting head, head knowledge. Yeah, there's one, in, there's one in Plano that you could probably participate in. I think I've got an email on that. I'll send it to you. Okay. I think it's the same, it may be the same time as the color guard rally in Denver. Oh, that probably, I think it is. So July 11th will be flag retirement. We're going to do a June 14th flag day. Green. Okay. 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 And oh, by the way, uh, is that the last meeting you brought that to me? The uh, proclamation from the city of McKinney, Peter, mm -hmm. for the flag day for SARDR? Yes. I think it was 2000. And well, oh, every year, every year. So actually, McKinney has a specific day for basically flag, uh, flag, uh, flag, flag day, yeah, uh, for both basically mentioning both the SAR and the DAR chapter. So we probably ought to try to get something going on that here at some point in time, too. Okay, on the uh. Memorial Day, the 30th, 30th, 31st, that Monday. Yeah. Whenever the uh, the SAR will be in almost at the head of the parade. Okay. It will be the uh, Sherman uh, Bagpack Player, oh. the Boy Scouts, and then the SAR. Okay. They will all stop at the White Pole in downtown Denison. And uh, the Boy Scouts will raise the flag and do the national anthem. And they have been approved for the firing of the muskets. All right. And something new. So, you've never, never seen that happen. It's really cool to see. Fire comes out everywhere. And, <laughs> mm -hmm. Anyway, that's right. I'll, I'll try to send out some information on that. Too. Okay, I just wanted to mention one other thing. Uh, as, as we mentioned, uh, Louis Juarez, who was, uh, I was trying to think about how long he'd been the uh, VP of uh, awards. Nathan, do you recall? I, I, he was the VP of awards, I'm pretty sure, when, when I came, you know, came into the chapter. Exactly. But it's, he's been it for a number of years. Several so years. several years, several years, quite a few years. So anyway, so uh, with his passing, um, uh, I asked uh, Peter if he would mind being the interim one. So we basically found a new one, a new a new officer, and he agreed to do that. The, the summer is a little bit of a quiet time anyway, so I think that's probably why he agreed to it also. But um, thank you, Peter, for, for stepping up when I asked you to do that. So we're so I'm I'm, I'm requesting opening, basically putting out a request for nominations for our vice president uh, awards. So if any of y'all are interested, or if there's anybody in the chapter that you would like to get even with for some other reason, uh, you know, and would like to submit his name, so he'd have to say no or whatever happens. You know. But anyway, we are looking for someone like that. Uh, I think uh, also uh, Bill Hurst has contacted me, and he was he was the re he was the register for our, register for our chapter uh, due to some health problems he's having. He's decided that really he can no longer do that. 
Okay, so he's he's not doing that. So as of right now, I'm acting as the interim registrar. Okay, so we have a we have a, an opening there. We actually have one of our again uh, probably within a month or two months at the most, one of, uh, uh, will be a new member who seems to be extremely interested in that. So I've got him uh, basically uh, connected with our, our uh, inland registrar and they're gonna start talking, start training. He's a genealogist already. And so I'm hoping that that will be good. He usually is here, I'm surprised he's not here tonight. Oh, well, oh, I know why, because he's in Italy or somewhere. Yeah, that's why. Anyway, but he's usually here. Uh, so anyway, but, uh, but we are, if someone else would like to volunteer in the interim, we're like Moise, looking for someone to pass a little work off to. So anyway, thank you. The last thing I'd like to mention, and then I'll let you go here. Uh, uh, it turns out, like I said, we, it's, I've been mentioning here, and we're gonna start ratcheting up the activities on this. Uh, our chapter is responsible for the fall, the fall board of managers meeting which is in October of this year, okay? And it's gonna be basically here in this area. Uh, it's at basically the Hilton over at Granite Park, which is in Plano. It's over there by sort of just to the south of the Ikea store, if you know where that is over in Plano slash Frisco. Maybe that's Frisco on the other side of the highway. I, I never can't keep those straight, but anyway. So right now as of, of, of uh, this point in time, I've got an update on the back here. I'm trying to keep y'all updated. It's where we are on this. So we got about five months before we have to basically handle this. Oh, well, have it, right, I should say. So as of right now, we have a banquet speaker, which is Carl right here. And he's gonna give us a, a dry run of that in September so we can see how we like that. So anyway, so that's, that's good. Well, we had the hotel selected, we made the first deposit uh, basically for that we have to make on that hotel for the banquet rooms and the food. It's really the food deposit. And oh, by the way, David, we're going to need another check in the uh, 1st of June. You're just greedy, aren't you? I'm greedy. Twice as much as the last one. So I don't know when you're going to be around or in town, but sometime before then, maybe we can have a crossing and I can pick that up from you. Uh, yeah, I think I get a mic stand from you also. Okay, I'll, I'll trade you a mic stand for that chair. All right. Not going to be good on it. Yeah. So what's what's the attendance like at these uh, fall BOMs? Uh, like, like 500 people? Or no, no, no. I don't know. Probably 60, 60 to 80, something like that. Okay. No, I was just curious. It's, and it's, it's really, it's only, it's not, in the big scheme of things, it's not a Real big deal. We just going to need people like when the people come in because it's a it's a state meeting. Okay, so they come in from different places. We got to you know we've got to you know they register online. We got to make sure because there's some meals involved, which you know are they get chicken, fish, you know, one sort of thing. Get a packet ready for them and be able to hand the packet out to them and those sorts of things. So it's not a lot of you know, it's, but we've got to have just people there. Well, it's open to everybody, but it's yeah. prim primarily chapter officers. But, but I would say I would recommend you coming because you learn a lot out of it. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's a it's a good meeting, sort of, and you get to meet people from the other chapters and that sort of thing. So anyway, so that's what that's about. Uh, we need an idea for the raffle items. Uh, so we do a basically a raffle where we sell raffle tickets. And uh, basically, then we draw a winner, and that money goes to. Hey, Ted, where does the raffle money go to? Is it the, it's, it's the, is it to the. Uh, goes to the the raffle goes to the. Uh, goes to the chapter. Raffles to the chapter. The silent auction goes to the Patriot Fund. I know you. Thanks. Okay. So so it's the opposite of what I was saying. So the raffle goes to the chapter. Okay. So uh, at the last meeting I was in, it was a bigger meeting. They actually had a uh, reproduction uh, rifle, a brown vest rifle that they rifled on. So, but they, you know, went out on a limb and spent, I think it was about $600 for that rifle and then counting on getting more $600, which they did, by the way. I'm not sure I'm ready to do that with the size of this time of meeting, you know, I think. So if anybody's got any thoughts on that, please pass those forward to me, something we might to wrap off. 
uh, whether, whether it's something like that, or you've got contacts with the Dallas Cowboys and get somebody some game tickets or tours of the star or whatever you might have. If you have some contacts, please think about that. Let me know. Um, and then we have a silent auction where we have various things that we raffle off. It could be uh, revolutionary war period books or even, even military type books. It can be other items. Uh, uh, the last one that we had, they actually were some uniforms, some you know, period, you know, color guard type uniforms that were there that were that, that you could you could bid on the people that either either you know whatever happened or you know as things do you know when you get older sometimes you can't fit in anymore so you got to, yes sir i talked to jim kirkendall about the silent auction that we have yeah and we're going to try to get every chapter to donate something okay uh, that's in the works he's got it he's got it, uh the motion before the, the that committee okay so we're going to see great that. thank you We'll see how that works out. I hope it does. We've already got some items that were left over from the last one. Plus, I've already acquired a couple of items I think we're good to do. So I think. But anybody that might have something like that, and that's as simple as if somebody gave me sometime, you know, a, a bald eagle statue, for instance, or something like that, and you already had three more of the same one or something, and you something like that would be good. Just whatever, whatever you know, hopefully with somewhat of a little patriotic flair or that fits in, but but we've also had things that had nothing to do with it at all that have sold, so you never know. Um, okay, so I think with that, still got the thing bond here for the, you know, uh, basically we're gonna need some of these volunteers. I'm gonna get sort of getting that all developed so we can know, know what sorts of tasks and how long it would take to things. So we're gonna need some support there too. And it's out October the 20, First or second and third, something that weekend in October. Anything else? Oh, we adjourned. Oh, you're ready for home, aren't you? <laughs> okay. If y'all would stand and uh, we will do our recession. How about the bed? How about the bed? Uh, that's a good point. Is he still on there? Yeah. Go ahead and uh, unmute, uh, Don. Unmute, Don Babs. How's that? Good. You're, we're ready when you are. All right. Let's pray. May the grace of Christ, our Savior, and the Father's boundless love. And the Holy Spirit's favor rest upon us from above. Thus may we abide in union with each other and the Lord and possess in sweet communion joys that earth cannot afford. All this we ask in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Okay, now we'll do the, uh, the recessional. It's in your book. You guys okay? Uh, let's see. Until we meet again, let us remember our obligations to our forefathers who gave us our Constitution, the Bill of Rights, an independent Supreme Court, and a nation of free men. Okay, thank you so much, guys. Coming, we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Oh, what is the thing? Oh, oh, anybody wants a book? He's got a book that he'll sign it. It'll be worth twice as much in a hundred years. Yeah, you too. Yeah. So I joined the library. So, hey, you can go say that. I'll go there again.
I thought it was you. Yeah, that was me. Yeah, I think the director. Oh, yeah. Anyway, that's a little easy. 